2013, vacationer Rick Nelson set out to explore Lake Iliamna in southern Alaska. He had been doing his own adventure tour of the state and decided he wanted to kayak the circumference of this massive body of water. He headed off alone with a small cache of supplies. Four days later, his kayak was found upside down and empty in an alcove. His belongings were nearby, intact. What maritime accident could have separated him from his kayak? And if he reached land, why would he leave his belongings behind? The mysterious circumstances of his disappearance have led many to invoke the legend of Iliamna Lake, that an enormous creature haunts its depths and attacks with impunity. Whatever happened, Rick has never been seen again. Inside the vast frontier of Alaska is a mysterious triangle where each year, five out of every thousand people go missing. Something out there. Three investigators look for answers. Jax, a former police officer. Ken, a specialist in strange phenomena. And Tommy, an expert on Alaskan legends. Together, they uncover mysterious sightings and ancient legends, exploring the possibilities of those who go missing in Alaska. The team heads across Iliamna Lake at the southwest corner of the triangle, toward the alcove where Rick's kayak was discovered. It's a secluded spot, far away from any towns. So you've got about 45 minutes, guys. Right on. Look how huge this lake is. What are the dimensions here? 77 at the longest, 22 by the widest. How many thousand, thousand, square, thousand square miles? Square miles? Yeah. I just can't imagine that this guy was actually trying to kayak the whole lake. That, that's a long ways. He'd be out here for a long time trying to paddle the circumference of it. So Rick Nelson comes from Missouri. He's been out here for about three months exploring Alaska. From what I gathered, he didn't ever seem really prepared with food and gear or any kind of planning. And it sounds like maybe that caught up to him. So I mean, what, what do you think happened? I mean, the normal things, you know, we're in a large body of water, did he drown? Even experienced boaters, fishermen, go missing and die every year. So you're talking about an inexperienced guy with a gung-ho attitude, not preparing very well for the elements. You know, it's all a recipe for disaster. According to those who encountered Rick, he seemed very cavalier in his adventures. Could he have simply underestimated this huge and challenging lake? I think there's one X factor here that we can't rule out. The Lake Iliamna monster, Ili. The Iliamna Lake Monster is a legend that dates back centuries to the native Tlingits. It's said to be fish-like in its anatomy, but much larger than any local aquatic species. Witness descriptions vary, but a composite image suggests a 30-foot-long animal with a blunt head for ramming and a row of piercing teeth for tearing prey. Modern sightings of this creature date to the 1940s, with dozens of reports from a wide variety of witnesses. I mean, I think we have to consider the possibility that that may have played a factor in this disappearance. From what I've heard about this lake, is it's not a, really like a lake. It's like a small sea. This is the largest freshwater lake we have in Alaska. It's not like a normal lake to go partying on, you know? And it's really rough and dangerous to be out here. Every year, people go missing in the Alaska Triangle, searching for adventure without being prepared. But I've grown up with Ely stories, so I'm curious to find out if there's any truth to them. Iliamna Lake stretches 77 miles long and nearly 22 miles wide, approximately the size of Rhode Island. It also achieves depths of almost 1,000 feet. Its waters drain to the southwest through the Quijack River which connects the lake to Bristol Bay and the Bering Sea. I mean, this lake is connected to the ocean. Right. So, I mean, there is a potential for sea marine animals. Oh. Holy cow, what is that? that? 
Hey, Captain, can you swing around? Got it. That was huge. What the hell was that? I don't know. A large splash has caught the team's attention. It could be just a fish, but in the Alaska Triangle, anything unexpected could be a lead. How deep is it, Captain? It's almost 400 feet here. I'm going to get the fish finder. All right. Tommy retrieves the team's fish finder, which uses sonar to detect any marine life swimming below. Okay, you can know, monitor and I'll operate. We got 150 feet here of cable. You ready? Yeah. Looks good. Still got pretty decent visibility here. How many feet we got left there, Tommy? That is it. That's we got it, it all reeled out. All right, well, let's just let it set and see what we get. Whatever made the splash appears to have fled the area. Nothing. I think we should keep going to the spot where Rick's stuff was found and keep our eyes peeled for any other marine life. Captain, can you take us to the alcove, please? All right, I'll fire it up. The team docks close to the location where the kayakers' belongings were found. They've brought a kayak of their own, which they'll use to place an underwater camera out in the alcove. It will monitor the water for any sign of large animals swimming nearby. Let's stop here and look for a minute. Got a nice game trail through here. So signs of wildlife out here. Maybe this guy, maybe he rode ashore left his kayak on the shore, and the bear got him. Everything floated away. What do you think? Easy explanation. I, mean, I just got to ask myself, why was this kayak overturned? I mean, it kind of leads you to believe this happened on the water. Mm -hmm. True. Mm -hmm. Guys ready to keep moving and get to the alcove? Yeah. So guys, I'm pretty sure this is the exact area where they dredged the water for the body. Of course, they didn't find anything at all. Oh, look at this. The wind's kicking up, and the current's blowing right into the alcove here. Lake Iliamna has a pretty good current to it, right? You've got feeder rivers on the north and east end, and then the drainage is on the Quijack River on the bottom. Right. So it's pushing everything in this direction, leaving the possibility that you know the refuge, or if there was anything left, it would push it and deposit it right here where we are, which makes sense that this is where they found the kayak. The fact that all of his stuff ended up here, but he didn't, is the heart of the mystery. I mean, one of the prevailing theories is that he was out deeper in the water and, you know, capsized out there, and his stuff got pushed this direction. Well, would it make sense that he would kayak out towards the deeper water? I mean, his goal was to, to kayak the circumference of the lake and stay towards the shallows, right? I mean, I, I agree. It doesn't make any sense, but maybe he just decided, oh, I'm going to go right across and wasn't prepared for it. There are a lot of aspects of this mystery that just don't add up. If he fell out and drowned near this alcove, his body should have been recovered. If it happened out in deeper water, his gear should have been more dispersed. Well, could there be any other animal out here that could have pulled his body away? I guess it's possible. I mean, we're in Alaska. There's all kinds of animals on the coast here, and we're, you know, we're connected to the ocean, and this is a massive lake. Who knows what's out there? Well, guys, the only way for us to really tell is get out there and drop this camera down there. The team prepares to anchor an underwater camera in the alcove where the missing kayaker's gear was found. The camera is equipped with a battery pack that will give it up to 50 hours of life. The weighted rig will be suspended from a floater, allowing it to scan the waters. It'll send a feed to the team's computer, which will save the footage for examination. All right, well, now the cameras are all set. Once it gets back, let's get back out to open water. The team heads out toward the deeper water of the lake, going against the current from the alcove. If the kayaker met his fate on the open water, it would have likely happened along this path. They'll keep an eye on the sonar for any signs of life, especially any predators that might feed on the salmon, trout, or other sport fish known to inhabit the lake. Yeah, it's as smooth as glass. You know, it's worth noting that most of the sightings of the Loch Ness Monster, for example, in Scotland, have occurred in conditions just like this. Many people usually say that the water is very flat and calm, very smooth like this. 
I mean, whatever is here in Iliamna is different than the global archetype of the traditional lake monster. Mysterious monsters have been reported in northern lakes around the world. In British Columbia's Okanagan Lake, the Ogopogo monster dates back to Indian legends that claim it requires an animal sacrifice to grant safe passage. In Norway's Lake Seljord, Selma is known as a serpentine goliath that will knock over boats. The most famous is Nessie, the Loch Ness monster of Scotland. Like most of its brethren, it's described as either snake-like or dinosaur-like, with a long neck that can rise from the water. Illy, however, seems to defy the mold. Sightings liken it more to a gigantic fish than its fellow lake monsters. Vacationer Heidi Baker saw a glimpse of this creature back in 1998 while hiking. I took a vacation to Lake Iliamna. I had heard it's a great spot for boating, for really good hiking. And one day I was hiking along a path that overlooked the lake and I stopped to admire the view. I noticed a V-shaped ripple in the water that was moving against the waves. And it's strange, but I couldn't see what was causing it. So I looked closer and saw sort of a fin-like shape in the water, and it was just a, a glimpse. It was almost ghost-like in appearance. And as I was watching, it eventually disappeared and didn't come back up. Being an outdoorsy person most of my life, I've seen many different types of fish, but I've never seen anything like that before. I know it sounds crazy, but I think it was the Ilianma monster. Here in Iliamna, it seems like we're just dealing with a giant, monstrous fish of some kind. Something that's grown to a monstrous size. You guys see anything? No, what about you? A couple of markings on the sonar there. What do you think we're dealing with out here, fish-wise? Well, I know, I know there's king salmon, sockeye, and rainbow trouts out here. At least we're seeing evidence that there's a viable food source here. There's something big going under the boat. You should check it out. I just saw the shadow. It's under the boat. I'll check it out. What direction, Tommy? Do you got a bearing? Alaska has long been a destination for those who like to live on the edge. The vast acreage of the Alaska Triangle is a place where people can explore new worlds and shed old ones. But this area also has the highest rate of missing persons in the country. Are people simply unprepared to blaze new trails here? Or are there dangers lurking that even skilled survivalists can't anticipate? An adventurer goes missing on Lake Iliamna, the reputed home of an enormous underwater monster. The team wants to see if there's evidence this creature might be real. There's something big going under the boat. You should check it out. I just saw the shadow. It's under the boat. I'll check it out. What direction, Tommy? Do you got a bearing? Tommy, check the sonar. How big was it, Captain? I'd guess 10 feet, but I didn't get a good look. It's gone. Gone? Gone. Did it go too deep? It went to the side, get deeper. I still would have seen something. Well, if this thing was as big as you said, it was probably, probably a very powerful swimmer. So, you know, obviously, it could have swum away really fast, as fast as it came into view. I'm not sure that the captain saw anything at all. Maybe the shadow was just a cloud overhead. Either way, trying to find an animal in a lake this size by chance is a classic needle in a haystack scenario. I think we need to go talk to some experts, then. Maybe dig up an eyewitness or two. Yeah, that would be good. Hey, Captain, you take us back? Will do. Heading back. All right, thanks. With their initial outing not providing any leads, Ken and Tommy travel to Anchorage to meet with marine biologist John Parlier. They hope his expertise on Iliamna marine life can help direct their search. Hi, John. Hello. Hi, I'm Tommy. Tommy, nice to meet you. Hey, John. Ken Gerhard. Ken, nice to meet you, Ken. Nice to meet you. We are investigating a case of a missing kayaker up at Lake Iliamna. Mm -hmm. Curious as to whether there might be a tie-in to these legends of a mysterious creature up there, the Lake Iliamna, Iliamna monster. monster. Yeah. What could it be? The most um, exciting possibility would be a plesiosaur that is known by the fossil records who have died out about 70 million years ago. They are reptiles, so they're air breathers. So they would need to surface to breathe. And I think a creature of that size having to surface on a regular basis would still be much more visible. Other potential organisms are the beluga whale. Problems with those, they're very surface oriented. A new theory is this oarfish. 
The oarfish is the best known embodiment of a sea serpent ever found. With rare sightings dating to the 1700s, this snake-like creature wasn't observed live until 2001. Oarfish are believed to get over 50 feet long and weigh 600 pounds. They typically reside in deep ocean waters, but when seen at the surface, their undulating swimming style and lack of scales make them seem less like a fish and more like a monster. The problem being for them to enter fresh water would mean an incredible change in their physiology, which they cannot do. They would die in the time it took them to enter the lake. What about some of the other big fish? Well, I have pictures of, of potential big fish. King salmon, very, very popular fish in that area. Some of them can reach 100 pounds. Rainbow trout, much smaller, obviously. The fish that I'm most interested in, this is a white sturgeon. They are native to all of the Pacific coast. These have been known to reach well over 1,000 pounds. You know, these are very migratory fish. They've been known to come up into the Columbia River, leave the Columbia, and migrate up the Fraser River in Canada. They like to investigate new habitat, as it were. And then we have all the seal species that could be potentially there. And there have been times when seals will pot up and be on the surface in a large group. And that's been one case where a man thought for sure he saw a sea monster moving away from his boat. The way they were moving made it look like a serpent in the surface. Iliamna Lake is one of only five places in the northern hemisphere with a population of freshwater seals. Little is known about this reclusive group of animals. It's only been confirmed in the last couple of years that they are year-round residents. Could glimpses of these unexpected animals surging through the water be the source of many supposed Illy sightings? So that would be my guess as far as something known. Do you know of any eyewitnesses that could possibly help us here? I actually do know somebody. His name's John Chamberlain. He appears to be a credible witness. That would Sounds be good. awesome. Yes. Yeah, I'll get you guys in contact with him. After making contact with the witness, John Chamberlain, Ken and Jax go to his house to ask him about his experience. Hello? Hey. Hi. Are you John? Hi, yes, I'm John. Hi, I'm Ken. Good to meet you. This is uh, my partner, Jax. Hey, how you doing, Jax? How you doing, bud? So thanks for agreeing to talk to us about your Iliamna experience. You might have some information that would be useful to us. Sure, yes, I do. One time in the morning, I was on the north end of the lake there. All of a sudden, while I'm kayaking, I see this this ripple of water coming towards me on my left side. And I couldn't see anything in the ripple. I don't know what was in there. And all of a sudden, bam, it hit me on my left side. But I went ahead and used my paddle to help keep me steady. Mm -hmm. And when I did that, I felt a jerk on it. And so I lifted it up, and, and part of it was missing there. What part of Iliamna was this? You said it was the north side? Yeah, the north end. Mm -hmm. And I, I do still have that paddle if you wanted to see it. Oh, yeah? Yeah, it'd be great yeah, to see yeah. that. Okay. I'm curious to see what this paddle shows, because hard evidence trumps a good story every time. Oh, wow. Yeah, there it is. Wow, crazy. I mean, it... Look at that, it's serrated, right? Over on this section, I mean, does it break off like that? Was I, the was... paddle old when you were using it? No. That would be the diameter of the jaw right there. I mean, that's far out of the range of a salmon or a trout. It's definitely not a sturgeon, because they don't have teeth. They have big suckers on the bottom of their mouth. The bite mark appears to rule out both sturgeon and seals as culprits. Could the team be dealing with a creature that's never been identified? Lake Iliamna is the largest lake in Alaska, covering more than 1,000 square miles. This vast habitat is home to enormous numbers of sport fish, like salmon, trout, and grayling. It also hosts a rare population of freshwater seals that thrives on plentiful food. But does it contain something else? A monstrous creature first described centuries ago in Tlingit lore. And could it be adding to the number of people who go missing in the Alaska Triangle? A witness's encounter indicates a previously unidentified creature. But what kind of creature could it be? The team planted an underwater camera near the spot where a missing kayaker's belongings were found. 
Tommy has been going through the footage and has found something the others should see. Check this out. You got something? Watch this. Cool. That's just a seal, though. Yeah, it's a, a seal just cruising by, but wait for it. Check it out. That's strange. What is that? That's what Did I'm talking about. It? Check it out. What do you think? That's a that's a fin right there, right? Yeah, that's that's definitely a fin. Look how huge that is. Yeah, it's, it's a pectoral fin, it's not the tail there. Again. The team can see only the tip of the fin. That's got to be huge. But based on the size of the shadow, it's clearly a large animal. Tommy, do you have that book John gave us, the marine biologist? Marine biologist, yes. Yeah, let's do some comparative analysis here. Check that out. That's a sturgeon. Well, this looks a lot more round and solid. Yeah, that's a round, more rounded fin. This one looks split, or maybe it's two fins. Potentially, it it could be a, a sturgeon fin. I mean, sometimes fins get injured when fish are younger, bitten off. The largest sturgeon top out at about 12 feet long. Could the creature captured in this image fit that description? Or is this something much larger? It's just not a good enough image, but whatever it is, it's big. It is. It's big shape. And big appeared form. to be chasing that seal. Well, guys, we know that there's been a seal population at Iliamna for years, and they're rarely seen. We really don't know that much about them, so it's also reasonable to assume that there could be something else out there that's also rarely seen, something very large that's feeding on these seals, and that is a real mystery. The possibility that something could be feeding on the seals here without decimating the seal population does have a biological precedent. The Pacific sleeper shark, a deep water dweller native to Alaskan ocean waters, is known to feed on seals when it ventures toward the surface. But at its preferred depths, prey is scarce. So it adapted the ability to keep food stored in its stomach for a long time, requiring fewer meals. Could an animal in Iliamna Lake be similarly living off the modest seal pods here? And could its infrequent feedings explain why it's so hard to spot? You know, I, I think, honestly, we need to get a, an expert opinion with regard to the seal population in Iliamna, someone who's familiar with the seals and what they look like. Well, I'll go with you. Let's do it. The connection between the seals of Iliamna Lake and the monster has been witnessed before. Martin Puck claims to have seen it firsthand in 1997. So I was up fishing Lake Iliamna, and this was a number of years ago. And I found this really promising spot. There were all these seals out in the water. And I mean, with the seals there, I assume they've got to be feeding and having a big school of fish under there. So I cast out my line, uh, and I mean, I just let it out there waiting for a bite. All of a sudden, I looked up, and the, the seals were gone. They had just taken off. And I started scanning the water for them. I saw this big shape kind of under the water. It just came out of nowhere. It was huge. Uh, and I tracked that for a little while before it kind of disappeared back under. It was just too big to possibly be a seal. I mean, way too big. Everyone up here knows about the Iliamna monster, and I have no doubt that's what it was. Hoping to learn more about how the seals might play into the Iliamna monster legend, Jax and Ken arrange a meeting with Stephen Pratt, a longtime bush pilot who works in the Iliamna area. Stephen? You yeah. Steven? Hey, Ken Gerhard. Hey, Ken, good to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for meeting us on short notice. Yes, you're welcome. Appreciate it. I'm Jax. Nice Jax, good to meet you. Steven, we're up here investigating the case of a missing kayaker out here on Lake Iliamna, mm. and we're looking at a possible connection to the Lake Iliamna monster. So right now, we're kind of focused on these freshwater seals, trying to get more information on those. We're hoping you have some insight. Well, you know, we've been flying the lake for years, and uh, you know, we see the seals. Uh, somewhat frequently. Well, you know, only very recently did scientists confirm that the seals were year-round residents of the lake. We've been seeing the seals for years, and there's been some biologists coming around and investigating this, and it seems like they're just getting on to what we've been talking about for years. And we notice they 
tend to head up into the northeast portion of the lake uh, in the winter months. And then in the summertime, we see them heading out uh, along the Quijack River there on the southwest end of the lake. You know, I think they're probably pretty hungry from the winter months and, and the salmon start coming in. And yeah, it seems like they're wanting to fatten up from a long, hard winter. Mm, that makes sense. Okay, this is all starting to add up. I think the monster sightings are following the same path. According to Stephen, the seals traverse a regular circuit around the lake, from their winter resting grounds to their summer feeding grounds, then back again. John Chamberlain had his encounter while kayaking in the early spring, and Rick Nelson went missing in late summer. Factor in additional sightings by season, and a pattern emerges. So the sightings of the beast seem to follow a pattern. Right, following the migration pattern of the seals. I got gotcha. you. So we still don't know what we're looking for, but maybe we know where to look for it. True. This pattern could mean that the Iliamna monster, whatever it is, isn't targeting people. Maybe it's going after seals, and humans in kayaks are a case of mistaken identity. You know, Steve, we could use some help on this investigation. Many of the sightings of the monster have been from a float plane. If we could have a bird's eye view of the lake, I think that would help us see this thing. Let me know when you'd like to go and be glad to take you out. Perfect. That uh, sounds great. We'll get all our stuff together. We'll let you know as soon as we're ready. OK, thank you. Good thank to you. meet you, fellas. Steve, thanks. In 2013, a would-be adventurer disappeared while kayaking on Iliamna Lake. A legendary monster said to reside here could be to blame. The team has discovered a correlation between sightings of the beast and the seasonal migration of the Iliamna seal population. Could a predatory animal have mistaken the kayaker for its favorite prey? And could that be part of a recurring pattern of attacking kayaks in search of a meal? The team wants to test this theory by taking a life-sized lure, a dummy in a kayak, to a waiting boat which will transport Jax and Tommy to the southwest corner of the lake. They'll be joined by a professional diver who will stand ready to enter the water and record footage of anything approaching under the surface. Hey, Alec. Hey, what's up, How you guys? doing? Great. Hey, guys, this is Alec, our diver. Ken. Hey, hey Alec, I'm meet Tommy. You. you be ready to jump in there for us? I'm ready. Hey, Steve. Hey, Ken, good Thanks. to see you again. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Ken will join bush pilot Stephen in the skies above scanning the water for any signs of unidentified life. The team heads toward the lower terminus of the lake, where its waters drain into the Quijack River on its way to the Bering Sea. The Iliamna seals are reported to be active in that area. All right, guys, I'm right over your position. Uh, I've got eyes on the boat. Looks like they're sailing up here. We're doing as much as we can to lure this creature in. But our theory is that the animal might go a long time between meals. So if this mannequin isn't tempting enough, this could all be for nothing. There is another possibility that could prevent Illy from making an appearance. It might not be an animal at all. Some have speculated it could be a military submarine undergoing constant refinement and testing in this remote body of water. Alaska is home to nine military bases, seven of which were started in the 1940s as a response to World War II. A renewed urgency for military preparedness spawned lots of technology development at these sites. Some have speculated that Iliamna's size and location could allow testing of an underwater craft to go largely unnoticed, and the existence of the monster legend provides the perfect cover. But would a top-secret military submarine explain the damage to John Chamberlain's kayak battle? And what connection would it have, if any, to Rick Nelson's disappearance? Oh, it's straight ahead, Tommy. Right up there? That's the mouth of the Quijack right there. Tommy, if everything's true, we've been researching. The seals are going to be here. It's the right time of year. So we think we get up there and turn the boat around? Turn the boat around, trolling speed. Throw out the kayak and the mannequin and see what happens. Yeah, we'll put the fish finder down, too. You want to tell Alec to get ready, too? Yeah, let's do that.
push him out. We rigged the kayak so we could tip it over and dump the mannequin in the water. If some kind of animal is checking it out, maybe that will encourage it to strike. All right, it's trolling pretty good. Then you drop the fish finder in right here? Yeah, this is a good speed here. You want to keep an eye on it? Yeah, yeah. Let me jump in the corner here. Hey, Captain, you maintain this speed for us? I'll stay right here. Thank you, sir. All right. Got a good view? We're all set. Right on. The sonar fish finder beams signals into the depths that reflect back to the surface, painting a picture of anything below. If there's an animal between them and the floor of the lake, they'll see it. Good picture. All right. Nice and slow, bud. Got a little bit of current right there. It's a bunch of darkness, man. We got the camera down and kayak out with mannequin in it. Smooth sailing. You see anything? There's a huge shadow in the water. It's heading towards the kayak. Whoa, whoa, hey, look. Hey, call Ken. Lake Iliamna sits at the southwest corner of the Alaska Triangle. This enormous body of water has seen a number of people go missing. It also has a history of eyewitnesses reporting what appears to be a monstrous beast roaming its waters. How could such a large animal live here while remaining so elusive? Is it possible it might have a low metabolism that allows for extended periods without food enabling it to remain hidden in the depths. The animals that are most notorious for extended fasts are marine-based. Frogs can go for months without eating by achieving a state called torpor, a kind of super sleep when food is scarce. Some can even survive being frozen during winter, with their organs protected by high levels of glucose until they thaw in the spring. Crocodiles can go even longer without food, up to three years. These animals gorge on large mammals, then settle into a sedate state until more food becomes available. But even more impressive is the lungfish. Not only can it survive both in the water and on land, it can live without food for four years by going into a hibernation state and slowly digesting its own muscle tissue. The team doesn't know if the creature they're pursuing has similar capabilities, but whatever it is, might be approaching them right now. You see anything? There's a huge shadow in the water that's headed towards the kayak. Whoa, whoa, hey, look. directly toward you. Do you copy? Over. Okay, we're going to drop the mannequin then. Hey, Ken, the mannequin's out. All right, Alec, we need you in the water. The diver, Alec, enters the water with a camera. But he'll also have a spear gun handy. His goal is to document anything that comes by and only use the weapon if needed in self-defense. Got this? Alec is equipped with a communication system that will enable him to stay in verbal contact with the boat. Radio check, radio check, check, copy. Loud and clear, loud and clear. Hey, Ken, we don't see it anymore, do you? Guys, I'm not seeing the shadow anymore. I'm not seeing the shadow. I don't know where it went. Over. 
Hey, Ken, we're going to make the mannequin move around a little bit, see if we can give it some lifelike movement. Maybe it'll attract it back. Alec, you see anything? No. Got nothing here. Stay alert, buddy. This is now the second time we've seen something big in the water that disappeared on us. If this is the Iliamna monster, it might have an instinct, a high sensitivity to danger. It knows when to back off. We might have missed a chance to identify it. Hey, Alec, why don't you reposition further away from the mannequin so you don't scare this thing off? Copy that. Yeah, we don't know where it went at all. We got no eyes at all. I'm seeing a huge shadow. I'm seeing it. It's moving close to the boat. To the boat? It's moving directly toward you. Do you copy? Over. It's not going after the mannequin. It's going after the diver. Jack's the diver. I don't see his bubbles anywhere. Jackson Diver, come in. I'm going up on the bow. OK. Jackson Diver, come in. Yeah, we've lost sight of the diver. It's not going after the mannequin. It's going after the diver. Jackson Diver. I don't see his bubbles anywhere. Jackson Diver, come in. I'm going up on the bow. OK. Jackson Diver, come in. Ken, we've lost sight of the diver. What do you mean we lost communication with the diver? Are you serious? Yeah, he just stopped responding. Can you search for him from the air? OK, I'll, I'll keep an eye out for him. See anything, Jax? No, nothing. I can't see bubbles or anything. I don't see anything back here. No bubbles at all. Jackson Ivor, come in. I got nothing, Tommy. Guys, I'm seeing something surface about 30 yards from the stern, right behind you. Tommy, I got bubbles over here. Port side, port side. Ken, I got him on the port side. You OK? Right on. He's giving the thumbs up, Ken. He's all right. What happened down there? What happened, Alec? Are you hurt at all? Grab my hand. <sighs> you all right? Oh. You OK, man? Something hit my tank, spun me around, and my comms went out. It was there one second, and it's gone the next. Could never get a clear look at it. Our mannequin and the kayak are still out there, so I think whatever was in the water was after you. He says something big was harassing him. I don't know if it was a monster or an angry seal, but either way, it's not safe for anyone to be out there. Whatever, though, man. Nobody else is going in the water. We're done, OK? Let's yeah. pull that stuff in. I'm going to contact Ken. Let's get our gear. Hey, Ken, we're all done here. We got him in. We're going to pull everything in. Let me check the dock. Copy that. I'll meet you at the alcove. Over. Having acquired no tangible evidence of the monster, but with no safe way to draw it in again, the team reluctantly calls an end to the day's hunt. They reconvene on shore to discuss what happened. You guys doing all right? We're doing good. What was that? There was definitely something there, something massive moving by the boat. I mean, how did it seem like it was invisible to the diver? What do you guys think, the murky water? I mean, is that why we couldn't see it? Hmm. Possibly, but, you know, I've got another theory. Think about this. Nature presents many examples of remarkable physiological adaptation. You've got electric eels. You've got deep sea fish that are bioluminescent. Animals that are able to change the color and texture of their skin to hide, right? Mm -hmm. Have you guys ever heard of aquatic translucency? I have. Like a jellyfish? You have? Yeah, exactly. Certain marine animals, particularly invertebrates and juveniles, you know, larval stages of certain types of fish, are virtually invisible. They're able to allow certain amounts of light to pass through their body. Translucency in aquatic animals is an evolutionary advantage, typically adopted by prey species to avoid being eaten. Some species, like certain squid, only have this characteristic when they're young and at their most vulnerable. 
Others, like jellyfish, maintain this feature throughout their lives. But is it possible that translucency isn't reserved for marine life that's lower on the food chain? Could an apex predator have this design, allowing it to more successfully stalk its prey? What if the animal here in Iliamna is something new, something completely undiscovered, and it's been able to you know, basically take on this adaptation, rendering itself essentially invisible? Cloaking itself, huh? Exactly. Yeah. That's really interesting, Ken. I mean, that would explain some of the experiences and witness statements that we've gotten. A lake this big, though, something to that size and degree that you're describing, I mean, it's almost going to be impossible to find. It's going to take a lot more time than we have to be able to find that. Exactly. A huge lake out there. And that's why the Lake Iliamna monster legend has endured. With 70% of the world covered by water, we've only begun to scratch the surface of the kinds of marine life that exist. Could a lake be the home of one of the most significant species still to be discovered on the planet? It would require a lake of enormous size and with a plentiful food supply, both of which Iliamna has in spades. And if other legends around the world are any indication, these creatures might be more common than we think. It could be one more reason people continue to go missing in Alaska. <laughs>